name is Mehmet Sawyer, and uh, I'm an environmental sociologist uh, with an interest in uh, social inequality. And mostly, I'm looking for um, community perception of um, the impacts of uh, especially fracking uh, in the regions. And, and also, I'm looking for land use controversy down in, down in Utah, especially uh, land use over over uh, uh, Bay Area's monuments and Grand Cays Escalani, and uh, who is going to use those lands, uh, especially corporations or banning corporations for oil and gas extraction. And, and, and today, um, uh, I'm lucky to be, uh, uh, to be a moderator for civic leadership program uh, at uh, European, Centr U uh, European Center for Populism Studies. Thanks so much for hosting uh, this great event. And, and uh, I am part of this um, research program on environment and climate change. And, and the, the aim of this environment and climate change actually uh, is to examine how the rise of authoritarian leaders and their populist political rhetoric frames environmental issues. And etc. And today, our guest, uh, our guest is uh, is Dr. Kai Bosworth. And um, let me introduce him. And um, he's gonna give his great lecture for us. And we're gonna learn more more from him, from him. And please take notes if you have question. And and also, if you don't wanna speak, uh, I'm always telling my students if you don't wanna uh, speak, you can write your uh, question in the chat box. If you would like to speak, you just unmute yourself that would be that would be great you don't have to to me actually you don't have to raise your hands just dive in and ask your question i guess that's the spirit of the education and uh dr kai is an assistant professor of international studies in the school of world studies at the virginia commonwealth university and he holds a ba in environmental studies from Massalister College and an MA and PhD in Geography from University of Minnesota. Bosworth is the author of Pipeline Populism, Effective Infrastructures of Grassroots Environmentalism in the 21st Century. I'm going to buy this uh, this week, I guess, which examines the possibilities and limitations of pipeline opposition movements in the central United States in grounding the popular politics of climate justice. His ongoing research examines the implications of the underground mines, caves, aquifers, uh, burial sites, and infrastructure systems or for how we think corporal feminisms and environmental justice politics. Thank you so much, Dr. Kai Bosworth, floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction um, and for everyone for being here today. Um, so I'm gonna, I do have a lecture and I do have slides, uh, but I would really like, you know, given that it's Friday um, and uh, this is a, a nice intimate space, if, if folks have questions as I'm going on, feel free to ping in the chat. Um, I'd really like to, you know, uh, get as much um, interaction and feedback out of this as possible, in part just because over the last, you know, um, 12 to 18 months or so, um, uh, I haven't gotten as much feedback on, on this work as I would have liked, uh, not going to conferences and the like. So I'm really interested to hear what you all have to say. Um, and um, and what you've been learning this week, and if my, my perspective uh, uh, resonates or is different from what other speakers have, have been talking about. Um, uh, just one note, Mehmet, my book's not out until spring of 2022, so you don't have to buy it quite yet. <laughs> but I'm really excited that it's it's finished. Uh, so, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and if you uh, like, you can change the view so you can see, still see me if you're interested in that. So um, basically over the last 10 years or so, we've seen really seen an explosion of environmental uh, protest over the problem of climate change that I argue has taken a different form than envir uh, environmentalisms of the past. 
rather than arguing that we should take individual action to lessen our impact on the environment, uh, or even that states should pass policy, um, certain policies uh, to do the same. Uh, youth social movements uh, around the world are instead demanding um, and beginning to form uh, mass political organizations that they believe are necessary in order to push the kinds of changes we need in order to address the climate crisis. Um, and uh, whether or to what degree we think the, the form of protest uh, and marches is an effective one, uh, I think that this is emblematic of really uh, the same, some of the same sorts of uh, political economic shifts we've seen uh, in populism in the rise, the so-called rise of populism over that same period. Now, at the same time, um, this has roots, um, not only uh, the sort of environmental populism or climate populism has roots, not only in um, the United States or the global North, um, but really especially in uh, a reaction to the failures of the international process, um, the IPCC um, and UNFCCC um, process for developing international climate policy. Um, the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth was framed as an alternative to both the UN process and uh, the Davos summit um, and held in Bolivia in, in 2010 articulating an entirely different set of principles over, uh, you know, concerning the rights of Mother Earth, as they put it, um, as well as uh, the roots of the climate crisis in political inequalities uh, and, and social inequalities and economic ones for that matter too. Um, and so the people is a subject that is articulated in this particular movement. Now, at the same time, the political right, uh, in one way or the other, um, has been increasingly, uh, with some amount of incredulity, uh, appropriating or beginning to develop its own discourse of environmentalism. Um, now, some people take this as disingenuous um, or uh, uh, fake in some kind of way. Um, given that many of these same parties, uh, what they do is, uh, you know, particularly environmentally destructive, uh, no matter whatever they say they're going to do. Um, and yet this is also emblematic of the same sort of uh, uh, populist shift, uh, the idea that even a far right movement has to articulate some imaginary a relationship with um, place, the environment, nature, um, the, the pastoral, uh, something of the like. Now, this is all in a very, very real context in which climate disaster seems readily apparent um, and increasingly so. Uh, you all may have heard about the um, really uh, record-breaking heat wave that um, has been happening in the United States Northeast uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, but uh, even, you know, fires, hurricanes, typhoons, and the like, these sort of uh, disasters are only individual features of a much slower process that's occurring all the time, um, and the effects of which um, it seems many scientists think we might have even uh, underestimated. So that's um, uh, you know particularly important when we're talking about you know why populism and the environment and, and climate uh, politics are intersecting at this particular point. So today I want to address this sort of situation that we're living in um, in uh, basically a three-part talk. So the first part of my talk today, I really think that in order to begin talking about populism, we have to have a theory of how it works. Um, and the environment is not just a subject for populism, I'm going to argue, uh, but it composes uh, 
uh, an, an integral part of all populisms. Um, it's uh, the medium through which populism emerges and is shaped, as well as a, a sort of special interest that it might um, discuss or not. So the first part of my talk is going to be theoretical. It might uh, resonate or be different with uh, what you've been learning this week, but it might. Um, I think it's particularly important to begin to have a shared language through which we can discuss. Uh, the second part of my talk is going to talk about the political right and far right and environmental politics. Um, really, uh, this is going to be a little bit shorter, but like just touching on some of the um, big themes, um, the relationship between climate denial and the far right, as well as anti-immigrant politics um, and the particular form of environmentalism that the far right is interested in. Um, as you can imagine, this is a um, anti-globalist, largely nationalist uh, idea of nature, but that's not as new as maybe we might otherwise think. And then the third part of the talk, I'm just gonna give some examples from my um, my research on pipeline politics of uh, the emergence of a kind of pro supposedly progressive or left-wing um, environmental or climate politics and um, pipeline opposition in the United States. All right, so starting with the, the first part and I'm mindful of time, so I'll try to be done around 10 or shortly thereafter, top of the hour or shortly thereafter. Um, so my approach to populism is um, most similar to what some scholars have called uh, uh, the performative uh, approach. And essentially what this means is that rather than taking populism as something that can be easily defined and pointed out, um, we're interested in populism as a relation and a performance. Uh, it's a kind of political genre uh, which partakes in the division of the political field into two antagonistic groups, the people and its other or the establishment. Oftentimes the elites is how I'm gonna talk about it today. Um, so uh, you can look up Benjamin Moffat's work um, as one particular kind of example of this. So if we take it as a given that populism constructs identities, um, like the people as a political subject, uh, relationally, that is in relationship to others who aren't included in the people, um, such as elites or globalists or whatever they think, um, then this means that populism is always in process. It's always in, uh, in performance. Um, as Marino uh, sort of puts it kind of poetically, populism merges the sensorium with social practice and the environment in the mecha mechanics of doing, in backstage production, in rehearsals. Sorry, my cat is like trying to advance the slideshow. Um, in back backstage production, rehearsals, planning, and the networks that make up the performed act. So really, I mean, we can think about performance uh, as being broadly construed, of course, about um, audiences, uh, staging, and the like. And we can see this both in kinds of um, the, the way that populist leaders act, their mannerisms, gestures, tone, rhetoric, and the like, but also how people who are their supposed followers are also acting on a stage. Um, they're using social media to present themselves in certain ways. Um, they're performing their sort of um, peoplehood, their commonality, right? They're constructing it um, in how they uh, act and dress and um, you know, operate in the world. Uh, this is true not only of the far right, but the the um, but progressive movements as well, and really all politics. Um, a protest is nothing other than a kind of stage performance, uh, one which is open ended and involves uh, collectivities, of course, um, but it's meant to demonstrate something to others and to the people who participate in it. So, if you read um, my article about the People's Climate March. Um, this is particularly apparent that folks are grappling over 
what the performance is meant to do, who it's meant to be addressed to, um, how its exercise of power works and the like. Uh, so the second particularly important part of my theorization of populism is space. Um, so I'm a geographer and space is kind of our, our primary category of theorization. Um, and so if we acknowledge that populism emerges in historical, political, economic contexts, um, and that means that it's performed not only by social subjects, but through those subjects' arrangements in spaces, um, in nations, crowds, social media feeds, um, in imagined future dystopias um, and apocalyptic scenes. Um, these are, while they're not often climate change, um, we know that that sort of theories of the, you know, the great replacement and the like um, uh, involve certain imaginaries of, uh, of, of sort of apocalypse and, and whatnot. So when we talk about space, we're not just talking about the stuff that's around you, um, but also your interpretation of that, your cultural interpretation, your political interpretation of that space. Um, what is a nation, you know, is not actually like self-evident. Um, it has to be constructed um, through national symbols, through attachments, you know, through um, uh, discourses that instruct you that the nation, that your nation is superior or under threat or needs to be um, defended. Um, uh, so the, another article that I shared with you, a short piece by Chris Lazat sort of discusses this, um, that populism mobilizes material and symbolic grievances through narratives about place. Um, about national and foreign territories, about environments and landscapes under threat and the like. Um, and so uh, this is a, in, in populist studies, I guess I would say, this is an underemphasized aspect. Um, oftentimes what political scientists are doing, um, which is, can be really helpful, is trying to abstract from space to try and develop a theory of populism that can hold across uh, very different spaces um, from the EU and the United States down to Brazil, Philippines, India, and the like. Um, and I sort of want to argue against that and say that uh, actually we need to look at populism in space to understand how it works um, and populism's theory of space. Uh, so the, the third part, and I mean, this is going to be a little bit more of a demonstration, um, but the third part of, of the theorization of populism that I've been working on uh, is escaping the kind of definitional trap of, um, of populism. So for a long time in populist studies, it was pretty common to begin every book that you read with a statement, nobody knows what populism is. It's vague and undefinable. Um, there's all these kinds of arguments about what the proper definition of a populist is, populism is, and who is, is or is not a populism, um, who are, is or is not a populist, I should say. Uh, and that kind of move, I guess I want to say, um, takes us away from populism in process, right? It says that populism is a thing rather than a kind of set of relations and performances. And so the word that I use to get out of this is, is genre. Um, and to say that populism is a political genre is to, in some ways, try to say that um, it's a mode of performing uh, and relating back to a familiar set of expectations. So uh, drawing on, on Lauren Berlant's work, um, genre can be understood as an institution or social formation that absorbs all kinds of small variations or modifications while promising that the persons transacting with it will experience the pleasure of encountering what they expected with details varying the theme. So to put this in the context of populism, what that means is that uh, populism uh, makes sense because it's citing um, both people's experiences and uh, understandings of history um, and promising a certain sort of fulfillment of those, uh, of those desires. So to give you an example, in the United States, 
um, in social movements, we oftentimes see uh, see folks of all political um, stripes um, citing the preamble to our constitution, which begins with the phrase, we the people, you know, um, so enumerate these, um, these principles. And so to recall that we the people in protest movements or the like, and say, wait, isn't this country about democracy? We the people in the constitution, you know, that evokes a certain sort of heritage um, and, and a certain sort of citation back to history um, that's recognizable to other subjects in this country. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not under debate, right? Because what is, I mean, part of the problem of populism studies is really thinking about what is democracy um, and what is liberal democracy? Uh, is it an institutional form or is it a social expression? That's maybe outside of the gambit of, of this talk. But. So um, one of the big things that I've been thinking about and trying to parse then with the concept of political genre is how we can account for the existence of both um, right and left populisms without sort of collapsing them into the same sort of thing, right? So how can we think about how uh, people with diametrically opposed views of the world um, seek to mobilize populist rhetoric, um, demonizing elites and the status quo, for example, um, and shoring up notions of the people, uh, while not actually evidencing um, the similar, a similar sort of um, politics. And so I think a helpful thing that uh, recent scholarship has done has really also included in the matrix of populist analysis um, the role of the political center in using populism as a term uh, to denounce all outsiders, all others um, that uh, don't uphold the values of uh, uh, kind of apolitical, technocratic, um, you know, elite governed politics. And we'll come back to and, and understand this in the context of environmentalism a little bit later. Um, and so the subject of the people is, I want to say, fundamentally different in these two discourses, but not to say that one of them, well, I mean, the people as an ethno-nationalist identity is uh, particularly pernicious, it's bad, um, but the people as a civic or democratic idea, identity as like citizenship or something like that is not without its problems either. And putting the center in the matrix helps us also understand how not only the perspective of, say, um, people within government institutions, as well as some academics, might look at um, and want to look at all populists as the same, as somehow denouncing their version of democracy, but also how from the perspective of both sides, um, the elites include the populist others, the, you know, people who would define populism otherwise. So for the political right, um, those who espouse mass movements, um, social democracy, um, and uh, democratic voting rights, for example, in, in my country, um, are defined as elites by, you know, the far right, despite the fact that they themselves might think of themselves that, you know, that le as left populists or something like that. And the same is true um, for the political left. They would see a lot of um, right populists, not only political leaders, um, but, you know, um, folks in uh, voters, social movements and the like, as actually being duped by corporations, um, by uh, those with a lot of money and power. And this is why, you know, this is kind of how uh, I would argue someone like um, in our country, Donald Trump, who's clearly a member of the establishment um, elite political economic uh, class, um, 
can in some ways slip into supposedly representing the people, right? And then a critique of him uh, that allows him to escape kind of critiques that would frame him as uh, an elite in, in some kind of way. So that kind of like back and forth uh, process is, is really interesting, kind of like an antagonism that I'm trying to think through. Um, and the other really upside of thinking about political genre is just that um, it also allows us to always remember that the historical contexts of populism are, are fluid and can be incorporated into uh, this matrix uh, pretty flexibly. So um, things that happen, events uh, in the economy, um, environmental disasters, uh, elections uh, can be interpreted uh, and reduced to understandings of your enemy, the elite, um, and the necessity for a return of power to the people. And that make, that's in part what makes populism a very, very powerful discourse, right? Um, because no matter what happens, uh, it can say the bad thing is caused by, you know, globalists or my enemy, um, whatever it is, uh, which means that we need to return to power. We need to return power to the people. Uh, and so this is like really open-ended. We can keep adding and adding and adding. These are just some of the things that I thought, you know, are particularly interesting and important to, you know, contexts. Um, okay, so before I move on, any, any theoretical questions, anything anyone wants me to explain more that they don't understand? I, I would like uh, if, if you can explain better what is this political genre, uh, I mean, it would, would be nice because I, I think you find it, I find it very interesting. Right. Okay. So one way of thinking about genre is um, let's go back to movies, right? Everyone's seen a detective movie um, in which a a uh, police officer or a private detective is trying to, you know, discover the roots of a crime, uh, who committed a crime, who committed a robbery, something like that. Now, this genre, uh, you know, has kind of noticeable tropes within it that allow it to be recognized. When you see a trailer for a detective film, you go, oh, ho, uh, I, you know, who's, you know, the person is gonna solve the crime, but like there are probably gonna be twists and turns, right, along the way. So you're both expecting something and you're expecting to be unexpected in, in a certain way. So, um, and, and this genre, of course, is somewhat trans-historical. We can go back to the first detective narrative uh, that many people cite, Sherlock Holmes, um, and all the different kinds of elaborations uh, that have happened on it since then. And so despite the fact that you can't like define, you know, there's no characteristic of a detective novel or a detective movie that would make it not something else, like not a political thriller or not um, a mystery novel or not um, an action film, right? Um, so genre is flexible and multiple in this case, um, and, uh, can, um, help us understand that, that sort of long persistence of something, right? So much like the detective, um, what would allow you to recognize a detective movie as a detective movie, um, I mean, all you really need is to have a detective and a criminal. Similarly, populism is so flexible because all you really need is to have a subject of the people and uh, the people's enemy, the elites or outsiders um, that are, are ruining their, their lives in some kind of way, right? Um, and so you can populate the story of populism with all different sorts of scenes, landscapes, performances, 
and the like, well, it's while well, still, you know, being recognizably populist in the form it takes, in the genre form it takes. So essentially what I'm trying to do by this is get out, is escape the kind of, um, you know, I called it a trap because we end up in these interminable arguments about like, well, is the defining characteristic of populism that there's a charismatic leader um, who performs in a crowd or something like that? Um, or is the defining characteristic of populism that it's anti-liberal or anti-democratic? Um, this is what someone like Jan Werner Muller would argue. Um, and I, I just want to say, you know, every, you know, populism is much larger than this kind of like uh, restricted definitional view. It's a phenomenon that takes place uh, in all different kinds of media. Um, you know, Muda, uh, Cass Muda and uh, Kultwasser in their little populism introduction book say um, populism is only rarely ever found in social movements. And that's kind of the thing where I'm like, no, you know, the, the idea of a political genre of populism as a political genre helps us see how it's cited in all kinds of social movements. Um, it's not a phenomenon that's restricted to parties and leaders. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to get at when I'm talking about genre is um, populism as a version of political storytelling, essentially. Is that helpful? Cool. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, so, so citing just what I said, so what is the far right version of populist storytelling when it comes to environmental politics? So the common version that uh, we can find in the far right is a certain sort of denial of environmental problems. Um, and uh, you know, the suggestion that any kind of uh, attention to climate or the environment um, is in fact uh, something that the elite has dreamed up in order to steal power away from the people um, and let in immigrants or migrants um, or the poor. Uh, so we can look at a couple examples of these. So um, AFD, uh, you know, in their, on their website says carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, but an indispensable component of life. Um, you know, true on its face, but also incorrect. Um, uh, the Finns say, you know, first, we cannot with any certainty say that there is global warming. Any human influence on climate is highly doubtful. Um, and Le Pen, you know, kind of puts a climate policy is just meant to justify the reception of an increased number of refugees. Um, since their situation was created by us who overconsume and have contributed to the destruction of the environment and these so-called refugees. So, um, the far right has sometimes what elsewhere has been called the, the watermelon theory of environmentalism, which is that it's green on the outside, um, but it's red on the inside, meaning that actually this is just uh, uh, socialism or communism in disguise um, and that we don't need to worry about environmental problems at all. So that's kind of like the common narrative that you probably all think of when, when we think about the far right and the environment. But in fact, I've, I've been really far more interested in the opposing view, which says that yes, there are certain kinds of um, denialism going on in the far right, and yet they still use um, environmental rhetoric and imaginaries in order to ground their ideas of nationhood, of um, restoration and the like. So let's look at, so this is Le Pen, you know, last year, a couple of years later in an interview and the interviewer sort of asks her, you know, um, you've been a climate denialist in the past, um, but now you say that uh, climate change is important to talk about. Uh, why did you change? And first she says, you know, I didn't change at all. I've always, I never said that, you know, climate change was denied, whatever. Right. But, but she continues, I believe every patriot must think ecologically and for a simple reason, 
A nomad can come to an oasis, eat all the dates, drink the water from the well, and move on when nothing's left. But we are settled, deep-rooted patriots. Our ultra-liberal liberal economic model is driving us into the abyss, and the left has hijacked the issue. Historically, the environmental movement was founded by the right. So what is she saying here? You can see in denouncing um, nomads, she's sort of implicitly denouncing migrants, right? And saying that um, unlike them, we are settled within our countries. Um, and that means we need to care for the, our countries, our nation's environmental resources, um, natural resources, and uh, protect them from the nomads who would come in and, and steal them, right? So instead of saying that, instead of appropriating, you know, the left or progressive or even elitist framing of environmental problems, um, she's trying to reframe it and say that uh, actually the political right is the environmental movement. And this confuses a lot of people, um, uh, scholars, it confuses scholars, it confuses regular people too, because they, if you are concerned with the environment or natural resources um, above all, then uh, this sort of story, this narrative about place in the environment can be very compelling. You see environmental degradation all around you. Um, and uh, here is an explanation that says it's not, it's not your fault. It's not your country's fault, but it's some other people's fault. Um, I think that this is, so we can see this in far right leaders. We can see it also within, you know, some versions of environmentalism. Um, I've written a little bit about this guy, Paul Kingsnorth, who was um, a part of the anti-globalization movement in the early 2000s, and then kind of like became something of a, a dour, nihilist uh in some ways got really into like poet like dark poetry and um this kind of thing anyway he has this piece in the guardian that um and advocates for after brexit um he's british uh something like a benevolent green nationalism so he has this whole argument that says um brexit is actually the fault of the left for not paying attention to how uh, neoliberal globalists um, ruin people's attachment to place. And instead, we ought to, and he's, he doesn't consider himself part of the left, but he said, if we care about the environment, we ought to cultivate um, the sort of feeling of protecting and nurturing one's homeland. Um, and this ought to be understood as patriotism, as nationalism and the like. Um, and you have to kind of like really pay attention to these texts to see how they work. Um, because essentially you might be like, okay, like he's talking about badgers and mountain lions, you know, no big deal. Um, but then of course the, the next paragraph says the implication of this is that um, we need to close our borders, you know, and protect um, England for the English and not for anyone else. Um, and that's the connection to place and belonging to place that um, the far right evokes with its sort of uh, kind of quasi environmentalism. Um, I kind of think all of this is just, again, like rhetoric and performance. There's not any kind of, because you can't actually produce just environmental outcomes or, or good environmental outcomes um, through this kind of, through, through either this kind of rhetoric or policies that um, would address it. Um, largely because of course we know that um, environmental destruction is principally caused by um, the exploitation of natural resources for profit. You know, it, it has very little to do with um national borders per se um and migrants of course are not the principal cause of environmental destruction um 
you know, it's uh, the very, very wealthy um, uh, countries, firms, consumers, and the like that that produce the most. Um, and that's kind of a generalization, but um, we can talk about that in details if you'd like. Um, a new book, if you're interested in the far right and the environment, um, is out from Verso. Um, and here we might return to think about, is any of this actually populist? Um, what these authors argue um, is that, uh, while well, some analysts would rather privilege anti-elite populism in the far right, um, that stance is actually secondary um, because the elite is primarily despised because it has opened in the borders and invited the enemy. Ethno-nationalism is the primary standpoint in the far right. And so populism, then again, going back to our genre theory of populism, populism is just one way that that sort of ethno-nationalist viewpoint can be expressed. It's one way of telling that story. Um, and so this book, I'm not done with it because it's like 600 pages long, um, but it has case studies on all the major far-right movements in um, far-right parties in Europe along with one chapter each on Brazil and the United States. Um, and it's uh, a pretty compelling, um, I, don't, I won't say I necessarily agree with everything in it, but it's a pretty co compelling uh, compilation of the statements that uh, people like Le Pen and uh, AFD and so on have um, put. Yeah, Maya, did you wanna ask a question? Yeah, I actually had a question about the previous slide. Okay, great. So I just was curious, I think it's interesting that the rhetoric, at least the the choice of words for this quote here is about protectionism, um, like out of duty to the homeland when um, in other like skewed forms of environmentalism that, that I've seen, it's about conquering and being able to like own space and, be, and say, oh, we will like, conquer this space and therefore we can run it the correct way and so I was wondering like is that um is that type of uh conquering rhetoric just like not part of the environmental conversation any anymore or is it like more subtext or am I like totally off base but I was just curious about that yeah totally um no great question um I I would say it's um it's in the far right texts and movements that I've studied, I would say that the primary story is, is not that like conquering has disappeared or something, but it's that something, it's that something that took place in the past and that like they don't need to apologize for, right? So um, we see this especially in settler uh, societies like the United States and Australia, New Zealand, um, where sometimes these guys will say, you know, um, we don't need to apologize for what our ancestors did to indigenous peoples. Um, you know, we sort of um, developed the, um, the, we won that struggle. Um, and that means we need to learn the lesson that uh, if we don't protect our homelands, then someone else will invade and um, conquer us. And so it's not that like conquering doesn't happen, but like in this worldview, uh, it, you know, almost sort of Hobbesian um, uh, sort of in eternal struggle uh, requires a lesson about invasion and protection. Um, and one can look at the history of colonialism and, and, and supposedly draw this kind of alternative lesson, if that makes sense. And so I, I argue, uh, I haven't written this argument down anywhere, but like you can kind of understand how one of the principal other relationships that's involved here, and this is true of Kings North in particular, is understanding uh, one's nationhood as analogous to indigenous people and their relationship with nature and the environment. This is especially true in Europe and especially true in, in Germany and Sweden, I guess, um, but particularly Germany, um, where but all these far-right movements will talk about themselves as indigenous, right? 
we are indigenous Europeans um, and essentially appropriate kind of the anti, the sort of um, justification uh, of anti-colonial movements and say, oh, we're just actually anti-colonial too and migrants are trying to colonize us. It's a very weird inversion because obviously it doesn't take into account, you know, the historical power differences between colonizers and the colonized um, and the fact that Euro European and Euro-American societies were the principal ones that produced colonialism. But um, yeah. And so like, yeah, if you, if you don't actually do this, don't actually read Anders Breivik, but if you read him, he would, he actually sort of um, says this explicitly. He's like, there's no, you know, we should actually, the far right should appropriate this indigenous discourse because everyone recognizes it as righteous and we can just say that we're indigenous people. Um, okay, so I gotta move on really quick to get to the last third. But I wanted to give one example of this and how, um, again, rather than looking at far right leaders, we can understand in a social movement and social space, how populism is a genre that comes under struggle. So the Gilles-Jean movement in France um, emerged as a kind of popular uprising against Macron's fuel tax, um, which primarily would impact those who travel more to get to work. Um, and those included, um, you know, a, a segment of, uh, well, included a class, I guess, of download, downwardly mobile workers um, who, um, in news articles and elsewhere initially sort of made the diagnosis of the situation that, well, Macron is talking about climate change as the end of the world. Um, we're just worried about the end of the month when we get, we would get our, our paycheck. Um, and, uh, that's a kind of populist move insofar as it says, you know, here the elites are worried about this thing at a scale that's distant from us and distant from our experiences where we, you know, regular people are impacted by this in a kind of um, visceral way, more immediate way. Um, the slogan though was quickly, um, you know, in the meetings and in some of the protests was quickly turned around um, to say, to produce a different sort of diagnosis, um, to say that, end of the world and end of the month are actually the same struggle, that um, the particular class politics um, and elitism that uh, climate change policy was taking in France was insufficient to the problem of either working people's, you know, experience of um, their own class position, as well as the climate politics that the fuel tax was supposed to uh, help uh, ameliorate. Um, and so we, you can, you can see how, despite the fact that these are, you know, somewhat different interpretations, um, they're both populist and they both kind of like, um, mobilize and traffic between different versions of the the political elite, um, the diagnosis of a problem, um, who is, um, producing that problem, how the return of power to the people in or you know regular people in some kind of way uh, is a solution to that. Um, and so this gets kind of to what Maya was saying um, really quickly, um, but just to say that like what we can learn from Gilles Jean and other sort of um, mobilizations of environmental rhetoric in the far right is in fact that the problem of elitism in environmental politics isn't like completely made up. Like they're diagnosing it in a way that is fantastical and um, backwards. Um, and yet at the same time, we know if we look at history that um, the diagnosis of environmental problems has been used by uh, elite institutions, by um, by the ultra rich, by white nationalists in the United States, for example, um, to consolidate their own power. 
um, and in the United States, uh, anti-immigration uh, movements um, have very, very close relationships with uh, uh, the form of environmental protection in this country. Um, uh, and I can go into that, maybe you can ask me about it if you are interested in that. Um, the class politics of environmentalism um, and the supposed sacrifice of jobs to the environment uh, is particularly important. And then of course, if we really want to diagnose the relationship between North-South economics and contemporary globalization and um, you know why people are, are migrating uh, right now, where they're migrating from and to, um, we would have to have a, a sort of broader lens on what is elitism. And I might not even choose to use the word elite to sort of diagnose this problem, but suffice to say that like, it's not, environmentalism does have a sordid history. And Le Pen is sort of right when she says that environmentalism has roots in the far right, or at least one version of environmentalism does have roots in, in conservatism. Okay, so i um, gonna spend around 10 or 15 minutes then just talking about my own research, which uh, primarily is not about the far right, although I write about it sometimes, um, which is constructing the people in supposedly uh, left or progressive climate movements. Um, so Mehmet uh, mentioned the, the book that I'm working on. Um, and essentially what I try to do in this book is take this problem of elitism in environmental politics as a kind of given, and think about how social movement actors are responding to it or see populism as one sort of solution to it. So if the problem in environmental politics is its elitism, then our, the, these, the people with whom I study um, respond that, well, then we need to develop a popular environmental politics, a non-elite environmental politics, pol uh, politics of the people and the environment, a mass climate movement, um, which demands, well, which invites certain sort of demands um, and certain sort of subjects, certain sort of people, um, you know? So like, what is the definition of the people in the people's climate movement um, or in um, the kind of anti-pipeline movements that I study is kind of the driving, the driving inquiry that I'm making. Um, so um, this is kind of the situation in which, so essentially what I'm interested in is people who are opposing um, these transnational pipelines in the upper Midwest um, and trying to use a populist, an explicitly populist rhetoric and um, political orientation to develop coalitions against uh, these pipelines. Um, and they've had some amount of success uh, which is one of the reasons why it's important to understand why what that tells us about uh, contemporary environmental politics and what its limitations might be. Um, so recall that when I'm talking about um, populism, I'm really interested in um, its performances um, in which people articulate the subject of the people versus the elites or outsiders. Um, and these kind of fundamental democratic political questions who will, who will represent the people or what is the expression, the real expression of the people that's supposedly not being evidenced in um, environmentally destructive uh, oil pipelines. But one thing that's, again, another thing that I think is different from um, what many scholars in populism studies say is they say, no one ever calls themselves a populist. You know, they say, uh, you know, populism is, a, is something that political science, that academia, um, a term that academia has invented um, and that we get to define what it is. Um, and this doesn't, I mean, I'm just so confused sometimes when I read the, that sort of analysis because at least in this political context, um, these pipeline opponents um, describe themselves as populists, okay? So they're not anti-immigrant, they're not far right, 
Um, by populism, they mean the kind of like democratic grassroots, um, you know, return of direct democracy away from uh, Washington DC outsiders and politicians who are so um, corrupt and removed from the situation that they don't understand the concerns of the people. So here's, for example, one movement leader who says that, um, you know, middle America wants less establishment and more populism. Um, she's the chair of the Nebraska State Democratic Party. So the, the um, le well, not really left, but like the farther left of the two parties in the United States um, and describes herself as pipeline fighting, populist, proud Democrat um, of this particular rural state. And so um, if we were to schematize what's going on here, um, we can see a, a performance in which uh, a, an identity of elites is established amongst oil firms, corrupt politicians, appointed government agents and the like, and a supposed populist coalition between landowners, environmentalists, um, indigenous nations and political organizations, grassroots political organizations. But of course, this doesn't, you know, automatically, like this isn't like this, the, what actually exists in the world. Um, these sort of, each of these sort of categories um, has to be brought together and brought in relationship with each other. And part of the reason why populism is particularly helpful in the situation of opposing oil infrastructure schemes um, is that you can replace these kind of individual connections with an identity that can potentially hold these different groups together. So saying uh, we need, you know, if you say we the people, if you say return the rights um, to live a good life to the people, in some ways that can gather together uh, the way that people think about themselves and they can see themselves in that movement. And they, oh yeah, I'm part of the people, you know, and you're part of the people. Well, okay, we can work together um, in a situation where otherwise they wouldn't see themselves as allies, right? An environmentalist and a farmer or rancher um, aren't, you know, wouldn't otherwise maybe talk to each other or would see themselves as opposed. But if you say, oh, we have a common enemy and we're part of the people that whose rights are being trampled upon, um, then you can begin to construct uh, a sort of civic populist environmentalism, you know, sort of identity of different across difference um, based on an understanding of oneself as members of a democratic um, polity, a place. Uh, so this quite literally happens through performances. Um, so in my research, I went to concerts, cookouts, protests and the like. Um, this is Neil Young and Willie Nelson performing in a cornfield in Nebraska, um, opposing uh, in, the, in the pipeline's route. Um, you know, the, the sort of collective politics that, um, that Naran mentioned, I think, um, are particularly important here. So to identify as the people, um, you know, being in a crowd and, you know, yelling slogans with others um, can begin to like develop uh, a kind of um, emotional ties amongst a group, right? Um, and then uh, there are also institutional experiences of, uh, of the supposed elite here. So one um, thing that takes place in the United States and a lot of other liberal democracies is that if there's a proposed infrastructure project, you have a public hearing in which input is gathered. Um, the uh, idea was that this is a way for regular citizens to provide democratic um, information um, 
that could help an arbitrating body like a utilities commission or um, you know some other arm of the government make a decision about whether a, a infrastructure project should be approved or not. Um, and people come to these events and they get up and they get about two minutes to talk and they'll say something like, you know, um, the people's rights are being trampled upon and we need to like band together, and, you know, whatever they say. And that kind of moment where you get up and speak in front of your allies, um, you, you know, it's very emotional for people who may have never been involved in politics before, may have never given a public speech before. Um, you can see people are wearing different colored t-shirts at this public hearing in Nebraska to identify who, what group they're a part of and the like. Um, so, and, and they experience, they're alienated from these institutional processes as well. So they really, really hate the people who are making the decisions because it seems like despite the popular will that is expressed at these places, that the elites are, have already made up their minds, that they're gonna approve the process no matter what the people think. Um, in actuality, you know, of course, the more people approve of oil pipelines than disapprove of them. But, you know, if you, you passively approve of oil because you participate in a society dependent on oil, um, whereas active opposition requires more participation. So it looks like this is democracy in action, um, the rights of the people being trampled upon when you know, that may or may not actually be the case. Um, but this is just a schematic. So we're not actually, like the people doesn't actually, um, it doesn't, it never reaches a point where the people as an identity position overrides other sort of concerns. So actually how we should think about this and we're bracketing the elites here for a second, um, that there are still internal antagonisms within the people. Um, and I think this is something that scholars on the far right or scholars who study far right populism don't pay enough attention to um, because they simply think that because an ethno-nationalist identity has been produced that, um, that it coheres everyone into like a strong mass organization. When in fact, for both right and left populist, uh, populist movements, um, internal struggles over the direction of the movement, its concerns, um, you know, what strategies and tactics it should take and the like um, continue. And so um, some of the things that my research actually sort of tries to demonstrate is particularly how um, indigenous nations um, get kind of uh, written out of the people. So the people includes everyone. And so the particular concerns of indigenous nations who are trying to reclaim um, political sovereignty over territory um, and certain sorts of relationships with land. And this is very complicated. And if you, I don't know how much you know about US coloniality and the like, but um, essentially what we can see is that the idea of the people, even in the civic abstract inclusive sort of way can produce uh, particular kinds of, of um, disaffection. And so all of a sudden, one group might no longer see themselves in the people or um, the identity of the people um, might uh, be assumed rather than constructed. So you go to a protest and then you say, oh, we are the people, um, but which we is that? Who is that we? Who is um, not included or feels included in it? What, is the, what are the characteristics of the identity of, of that group. Um, and so we can see this in, you know, especially with regards to land where private property holders say, this is our land um, with kind of like, and this can bleed into kind of nationalism. Whereas indigenous people say, no, this is actually our land and you are just inhabiting it. Um, and uh, it's actually your ancestors who were the elites who stole this from us. And yeah, so it gets complicated really quickly. Um, and then on top of that, of course, you know, the people isn't, the relationship between the people and the elites isn't internal or it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, 
it's a reduction, right, of complicated uh, politics. And so um, in this particular case, the elites, oil firms, um, uh, utilize, for example, uh, media and advertising images of pipeline workers um, and families and the like to say that actually the pipeline is for the people, you know, and you guys are the elites. Um, and there's also a, a more radical critique of this sort of mode of doing politics that says, oh, the people you're talking about isn't the right people. We should instead have a movement that say, led by indigenous nations or led by the working class. Whereas what you're talking about when you say the people is too broad, it includes too much. Um, it's not specific enough to the, the roots of the problem. So I realize this is schematic, I'm not giving a lot of details, but that's just kind of like the story or the example I wanted to give you of how one can do an analysis of a populist social movement that doesn't fall into kind of like only focusing on charismatic leaders um, while still attending to how uh, performances of people and the environment, their attachments to place, um, to uh, certain sort of scenes of populism, of generic populism, um, can both become effective, will have limits to, um, real limits to the kind of political organizing that the climate crisis sort of demands. Um, so populism is one answer to the problem, but it doesn't solve or exhaust the problematic, which sort of persists. We still have to answer these questions, how to develop mass climate movement, what demands, what subject, um, and we can, then we would get into normative claims. Should environmentalism be populist or not? Um, and different people would come with different answers to that. Uh, but yeah, that's the end. Um, and I'll just quickly summarize, but I'm really curious what you guys think. We've got to take a quick break um, and whatnot. But essentially what I'd say the big takeaways for my talk today are that we can theorize populism as performative, as spatial and environmental and as a political genre, which can lead us to richer analyses that complicate the simplifications of populism. We don't have to buy into the easy division between the people and the elites. We have to see how it's constructed um, and how it actually works or fails to work in any given situation. Um, I think that the analysis of the political right, left and, and center um, shows us how the populist genre can be used in widespread ways to critique the status quo without seeing these as the same, without denouncing the ways that a mass movement works to protest a pipeline as being the same as a mass movement to protest immigration or something like that. These are just because you only at a certain level of abstraction do these look the same when in fact they work differently. Um, and then finally, that populism is not just like environmentalism isn't just an issue that populists address, but all populism uh, and really all politics is articulated through physical and imaginary territories, through understandings and relationships to land, landscape, property, space, um, and, and the like. So, um, and I think that that can be extended to whatever you study. And if you don't think it can be extended, I challenge you to ask me and I'll say, uh, um, otherwise, maybe. Okay, um, that is the end. Uh, thank you all for listening so patiently and I'm very excited to hear uh, your questions or critiques or whatever. <laughs>